My soul is welcome here. Your soul is welcome here. Welcome once again to Unity of New Westminster Online Edition. My name is Reverend Rona Segarra and it is my pleasure and privilege to welcome you on behalf of our community that is self-isolating in various places at, at home. We look forward to a time when we can get together again in person. And in the meantime, we're so grateful for the gift of technology that allows us to greet you and remain connected with you in this way. So welcome, whether you are joining us on Facebook Live, whether you are joining us through Zoom, whether you are seeing us later on a recording either on YouTube or on our website. It is, consider yourself connected with us. We open our service as we always do in a time of prayer. We acknowledge that we are standing and sharing the space on the traditional territories of Coast Salish peoples. This land on which we live, we work, we learn, and we play. We are so grateful that we can be here in this land, this beautiful country, this land of Canada, where we can connect heart to heart, mind to mind, across the airwaves, across the internet. We acknowledge that there is only one power, one presence, that power, that presence, that creative energy is understood by many names. Some call that energy God, others Allah, Yahweh, Creator, the Force, Divine Intelligence, Mother Earth, thousands of names seek to describe the undescribable, that power in which we live, we move, we have our being, that power which unites us all. And it is in that sense of unity that we send a blessing of love to all people, regardless of nationality, of race, of creed, of age, of gender, of ability, of political ideology, of career, by whatever threatens to divide us because we see it as deaf different. We see beneath those differences to our oneness. And it is in that oneness that we bless all. We are grateful that we can come together in blessing, knowing that when we bless, we make a difference. We raise the energetic vibration of love on the planet. And that is the power in prayer. And for this knowledge, for this truth, for this power, we give thanks. Amen. The unity movement teaches spiritual principles for full and abundant living. We draw on the teachings of Jesus as our primary way shower, our example. The man who was one with his humanness 
as well as with his divinity. And we honor that there is wisdom in faith traditions all over. And we honor every person's right to choose their own spiritual path. All are welcome, all are celebrated, and all are worthy at Unity of New Westminster. Today's daily word is world peace. The affirmation is, I contribute to peace in the world. When I learn of conflict in my community or in the world, my response may be frustration, sadness, or anger. If I have those feelings, I remember that I am more than merely human. I am a living expression of God, heir to all that God is. I use my divine faculties of wisdom, understanding, and love to create the abiding peace that is my birthright. Centered in divine peace, I realize that every person is as much an expression of God as I am. As differences dissolve in a way that transcends human understanding, I come to know oneness with all the world's people. I let this realization shape my response to every person and every situation. In an awareness of my oneness with all people, my thoughts, my words, and my actions contribute to peace in the world. And from the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 22, the glory you have given me, I have given them so that they may be one as we are one. And so that is. Today I'd like to take us into a time of quiet meditation before we begin our talk. In this last week, we have reached some very unpleasant milestones in the spread of, our, of the pandemic, which is crossing the entire planet. And there may be times now where we are feeling more anxious, more wanting to get outside, more wanting for this to be over, and perhaps feeling a little helpless, like we might as well just go and do this because what's the point? And I think it would be appropriate to take a step back, reflect on how far we've come, and honor the people who are working so hard including us, to, to support everyone in this time of pandemic. So I invite you, if it's comfortable for you and safe for you, to close your eyes with me for just a few moments. And take a deep breath. Feel that air coming into your body. And feel the air as it releases from your body in that beautiful eternal cycle of new life and release. Just take a few breaths now and give thanks for that air. as it circulates and brings life and cleanses in one 
cycle. And now as you breathe, allow your body to relax. Allow it to sink onto the seat. If your feet are on the floor, feel how your feet are supported by the ground. And allow your body just to rest. Now start feeling the feeling of calm. Allow your mind to just do what it does and sink beneath that, focusing on your heart. Imagine that you are breathing as if you are breathing from your heart. Feel appreciation for that magnificent muscle. That feeds your body with life giving oxygen. That heals your body by removing toxins, working with the lungs to feed and to release. And in this place of appreciation, I invite you to think in terms of white light, gentle white light that is enfolding and supporting you, those you love. those in our city. Feel that light as it expands from you further and further out. And as it expands, feel the expansion within yourself. This light that expands outward in appreciation for all who are supporting us at this time, for those who are working so desperately hard to keep us safe, to keep us fed, to keep our children learning. To keep us feeling financially more secure. Imagine that light expanding and surrounding those who are in grief at the moment. Those who have lost loved ones. Imagine that light surrounding those who have passed as a result of this pandemic. Supporting them on their journey with gratitude for their life. And then slowly bring your attention back inward 
to your own life. And imagine surrounding yourself in every aspect with this warm, comforting blanket. This blanket that appreciates all that you are going through. Times when you may feel fearful, times when you may feel joyful, times when you feel anxious, times when you feel peaceful, times when you just want to get outside, and times when you are comfortable staying home. Surround all of it in a blanket of acceptance, appreciation, love. We are all in this journey together. And we travel each individually. Here is the time where we can emotionally hold each other's hand, helping those who stumble, knowing that they will be there to help us when we stumble. becoming more aware than ever that we are interconnected, one family, one humanity, one earth. How beautiful that awareness can become.
It all began in 1977. The same year that Elvis passed away, the same year that our family came to Canada, emigrating from South Africa, the same year that the first Episcopalian priest, who was a female, was ordained in the United States. The year that Rocky won the Academy Award for Best Movie, and Roots was the television hit of the year. The songs on the hit parade were Dancing Queen and Knowing Me, Knowing You by ABBA. And remember the song, You Light Up My Life by Debbie Boone. I was a teenager trying to create new roots in a new country, trying to figure out who my new friends would be. 1977. A remarkable movie was released. From the first opening scene, long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, Star Wars revolutionized movie making from not just a technical point of view, but from its theme material. It was the first movie series to put humans in galaxies, pitting the forces of good, the Jedi, against evil counterparts, the Sith, who of course want to control the universe. Star Wars, with its blend of cute robots, interesting other, uh, otherworldly creatures, diverse planets, and likable humans, brought us an imaginative, entertaining, funny, and engaging spiritual story without being overtly religious. It introduced a way to examine spiritual concepts in a secular way, rather than through the religious framework of the traditional church. And in doing so, a movement of fans that are alive today was born. To the point that, you know how the internet has Wikipedia? Well, there is an entire database of Star Wars material on a website which is called Wikipedia. The movie was groundbreaking at the time, as I said, but 15 years after, when I showed that movie to my son David for the very first time, it still was a powerful movie that captured our attention. And nearly 40 years later, I showed the movie to other children and the same thing happened. We were all entranced once again. We are struck by the timelessness of this movie and its message, this whole series. An oft-repeated line occurring in most of the nine Star Wars movie series is, may the force be with you. And that has become something that Star Wars fans have embraced on May the 4th every year. And so tomorrow on May the 4th, there will be Star Wars fans across the planet who will be gathering, some in costume, hopefully distancing and staying safe in doing so, but gathering to watch movies, the entire series of nine movies, dressing up and sharing their experiences and their love and passion for this amazing movie series. What's all the fuss about? Well, before 
I share some of the insights. I want to just tell you a little bit about the movie series itself. I mentioned that there are three, that there are nine Star Wars movies. There are actually three trilogies, so three sets of three movies. And in 1977, when the first Star Wars trilogy came out, it was actually chapter four, five, and six of the nine chapters that the movies now represent. How many years later? 22 years later, the second trilogy began to be released in 1999. And so that was chapter one, two, and three. So they were like the prequels for what we had already seen. And then, much, much later, in 2015, we got to see the beginning of the last three movies. So all in all, it has taken 42 years to tell the whole story of the Skywalker saga. Skywalker is the name, last name, of the primary character, Luke Skywalker. The first three movies, which are the most well-known, at least to my generation, tell the story of a young man named Luke, who is an orphan and who lives on a farm with his aunt and his uncle on a barren de desert planet. A spaceship carrying two robots lands, crash lands nearby. And one of the droids has a message from a princess asking for help from an aging wise man known as Obi-Wan Kenobi. This man is a Jedi Knight who is powerful and knowledgeable in the Force. The Force is this unseeable, mysterious energy field that pervades everything. And while the droids are finding, uh, while the droids and Luke go and find the old man, evil forces come. They are also on the hunt for the droids, and they kill Luke's aunt and uncle. With nothing to lose then, and a princess to save, Luke embarks on this journey, an adventure in which he sets with Obi-Wan Kenobi to try and help the princess. After destroying a battle machine called the Death Star, the evil forces appear to have won. And Luke resolves to improve and understand the use of his, the force for himself so that he can take on and fight these evil forces. So he realizes that he needs to be more skilled in the Force. He wants to use the power for good. And so he goes to another planet where he meets another wise old being, 900-year-old Yoda. Yoda is a spiritual master, a Jedi master who teaches Luke about the Force. So today I am going to share with you some of the wisdom of Yoda. He is my favorite character because A, he's super cute, and B, he speaks in this wise way and he twists his letters, his sentences around so that they aren't really plain English. And that just makes him even more adorable. One of the first things that Yoda 
does is teaches Luke how to start raising things with the power of his mind. When he feels that Luke is ready, he tries to get Luke to raise an old X-wing fighter, an airplane, from a swamp. It is buried, it is muddy, it is icky, and Luke has trouble doing it. He turns to Yoda, and Yoda says, Size matters not. Look at me. Judge me by my size, do you? This is one of the first lessons that I want to share with you. The idea of judging someone by their size. Judging someone at all. As an aside, this is one of my mom's favorite t-shirts. She has a t-shirt that says, judge me by my size, do you? So Luke is supposed to raise this airplane, X-wing fighter plane, and he gives up and he says, I can't because it's too big. And... Yoda's response is, it's not too big. You're judging by something that's not real. Now, how often have we judged others by an outer appearance? How often do we look at someone and make a judgment about whether or not they are able whether they are worthy, and whether or not we should have anything to do with them. This message from Yoda is to remind us that whether it's size, or whether it's weight, or whether it's ability, or whether it's gender, or whether it's who we choose to love, none of that matters. What matters is what we are inside. And a key phrase in this teaching of Yoda's is, size matters not, look at me. Look at me. See through the outer and go within to the heart of the person. Let us not mistakenly use these outer judgments as a measure of a person's power or their ability or their worth. In the book of James, we are told, do not hold your faith with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes, saying, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit by my footstool, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? I'll tell you another quick story, and that is that in the Old Testament, God tells Samuel that he has chosen one of the sons of Jesse to become the future king. And Samuel should go to Bethlehem and find and anoint the boy. Well, Samuel goes and sees Jesse's children, and he makes the assumption that the future king will be Jesse's oldest son. 
But God says, no, he's not the one. And this is what it says in the Hebrew scripture. Quote, looks aren't everything. Don't be impressed with his looks and stature. I've already eliminated him. God create, judges persons differently than humans do. Men and women look at the face. God looks into the heart. End quote. God looks into the heart. In the end, Samuel sees seven of Jesse's sons, and none of them are destined to be the future king. Finally, in desperation, Samuel says to Jesse, well, do you have any more? Because these aren't the, the chosen one. And finally, they go and fetch David. David, who is considered perhaps the runt of the family. He's the youngest. He was in the field taking care of the sheep. And of course, the person who was least expected to be king becomes not just the king, but also the forefather of Jesus. And speaking of Jesus, was he also not born into lowly circumstances? And yet he transformed the world, our world, with his heart. Who would have thought that the son of a carpenter would become the one to show us a new way? Who are we to judge? Here's an idea. When reflecting on size matters not, judge me by my size, do you? Try replacing the word size with whatever you are judging with. For example, height matters not. Judge me by my height, do you? Intelligence matters not. Judge me by my intelligence, do you? Gender matters not. Judge me by my gender, do you? Profession matters not. Judge me by my profession, do you? And so on. Looks, weight, money, power. Look beyond. Yoda, with his question, judge me by my size, do you? Reminds us that we want to challenge our thinking and when we make value judgments to remember that what's inside matters far more than the outside appearance. I'm going to talk about the force itself another day because it is it is a talk on its own. But here's one of the sayings that Yoda has that I want you to hold right here. And that is, luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. When Luke tries to raise that X-wing fighter from the, from the swamp and he finds it too big, Yoda says, luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. Feel the force around you, here, between you, me, the tree, the rock, everywhere. Yes, even between the land and the ship. Let us remember that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He also said, 
You are the light of the world. Luminous beings are we. We are light. We are more than crude matter. Let us remember that. Here's another one for you. Fear is the path to the dark side. Yoda said, Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Fear to anger to hate to suffering. You may have heard the notion that there are two basic emotions, love and fear. Fear leads to the dark side. Fear leads to anger, hate, suffering. What that says to me is that the dark side is suffering. Living in suffering is living in fear, in hate, in anger. And at this time of global pandemic, we are experiencing fear. We are experiencing anxiety. And we are seeing fear expressed in anger, in hatred, in increased suffering. And at a time when we might be able to come together in a household and support each other, there are horrible reports that domestic abuse is increasing. Now one of the other words of wisdom that is said by Yoda, and I couldn't find the movie that it was in, is this. Maybe it was written by George Lucas himself. Named must your fear be, before banish it you can. Named must your fear be, before banishing it, you can. You see how he speaks in this kind of strange way that makes you have to think twice to understand what the words are. Basically, what Yoda is saying is, name your fear. When you name your fear, it reduces the anxiety, it reduces the anger, it reduces the suffering. How do we do that? How do we come out of fear? Well, the first thing is to recognize that it is normal. And to recognize it for what it is, a normal emotion. The challenge is to have the fear but not let the fear have you. To feel the anger but not let the anger have you. To feel the anxiety but not to let the anxiety overwhelm you. Naming your fear is one of the best ways to de-escalate the emotion that you may be experiencing. And then when you're calm, another one of Yoda's quotes is, you need to be calm. I can't remember the exact words, I'm sorry. But when you are calm enough, having named your fear, named your anxiety, then you can ask yourself questions like, is this true? 
Is this really true for me that I need to be afraid? Is it really true for me that I need to be this 